But beginning at verse 10, reading to verse 13, Hebrews chapter 2, it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Now, in our last study, and this is why it's going to take a while, I want to develop a few things with you. In our last study, we saw that man was created to have dominion. It says in verses 7 and 8 in chapter 2, You have made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So man was created to have dominion. But because of the fall, no longer are all things under his authority. You see, when Adam fell, God brought a curse on man, and man lost dominion. In Genesis 3, 17 through 19, it says that God said to Adam, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken for dust you are, and to dust shall you return. And so by yielding to the temptation, man forfeited his authority. So at that point, Satan became what Jesus called the ruler or the prince of the world. In John 12, 31, it says, The judgment of this world, now is the judgment of this world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So Satan's desire is to be like God. He influences, he inspires, and he energizes unbelievers. Ephesians 2 verse 2 says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So the spirit that is now at work in the disobedient is Satan, who has created an opposition kingdom. And so the entire worldview and moral system of unbelievers is under Satan's influence. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control, under the sway or power of the evil one. So the influence of Satan is revealed clearly in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 32. We've gone through that recently. You can read that on your own, but it's a, in a list of a variety of sins. And these are sins that are habitually practiced, and they're the fruit of being under bondage. Now... Satan became a ruler, and this is something that he directly stated to Jesus himself. When Jesus was being tempted, and it's recorded in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, it says the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And so Satan became the chief influence of the world. And his influence is to keep people from God. He is called the God of this age. He's the one who opposes God's efforts to save man. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And some of you have discovered that. Some of you have discovered that you may be quoting scripture, you may have it in context, you may be making logical sense, and you're speaking to somebody about Christ, and you're speaking of the gospel, and their eyes are blinded. They don't see, they don't listen, they don't understand, they cannot perceive. So it's more than simply delusion. They're in bondage to sin. And they're also inoculated in a certain sense from the gospel. They don't want to hear it. They reject it. So by calling him a prince 
or a god or a ruler does not mean that Satan has ultimate authority. We all know that the true God has absolute control. Satan only has what is called limited power. Now you see that when you read the book of Job. And it speaks concerning the angels of God showing up before the Lord to give an account of the things that they're doing and all. And Satan also shows up and how the Lord speaks to him and how the Lord uh, begins to speak concerning my servant Job and how Satan, when God says, have you considered him? Have you seen him? Have you weighed him? What do you think about him? Basically, he says, well, you put a hedge about him. So he had to seek permission from the Lord God to do the things that he ultimately did with Job. He doesn't have absolute authority. He did the same kind of thing when he asked permission uh, to sift Peter, even as he says, as, as uh, wheat has been sifted. So he doesn't have absolute authority. He has to gain permission. He has to do that because he doesn't exercise that kind of control. He's limited but he has freedom, great freedom, and he opposes God. And he has certain abilities of manipulation and control and influence. He's called the God of this age. He's the God of this world. And he has tools that he uses to blind the minds of unbelievers. And through his deceit, he has convinced people they don't need salvation. He's inspired various religious paths. He promises people what he promised Eve You'll be like God. And he has spokespeople who present that to you. Perhaps some of you heard recently how the, uh, how the Roman Catholic Pope was saying that basically all paths lead to God. Well, that's absolutely not true. There's only one way, and that's what Jesus himself said, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so he has inspired people, even religious people, and in doing so, they're pointing to the wrong source. It's Jesus Christ. And what he does is by inspiring people to follow something that is religious and all, he keeps them prisoner to their sin. That's why we are commanded to communicate the gospel. And it's called the gospel of freedom. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, Paul said, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So this gospel of freedom is centered on Jesus and what he did on the cross. It's called the message of redemption, and it's a, a redemption that produces restoration. You see, in the fall, man lost his ideal station. But in Christ, he regains that which was lost. Now, this is what the author has been pointing out to us. Insignificant man occupies the mind of Almighty God, a God who cares for us. And though on earth, less than angels, our future, his future holds glory, honor, and dominion. And Jesus came to bring us to the condition that God originally created for us. We are sinful and we're fallen, but by his sacrifice, we're restored. All believers will reach the picture of Psalm 8 by virtue of their union with Christ. 2 Timothy 2.12 simply says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. In Revelation 5, 9 and 10, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. You were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And so we've been looking at that here in chapter 2, and that's why, again, I'll draw your attention to verse 9. How the writer says, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So in contrast to man's sinful nature, he said, see Jesus. He didn't fail. We can trust him to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. In 1 John 3 verse 5, it says, you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him, 
is no sin. In Hebrews 4:15, we have not a high priest who cannot we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he says, without sin. So Jesus, he said in verse 9, had become flesh for the purpose of suffering death. The Lord became man in order that he might die on behalf of sinful man. Genesis 3:15. God said, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Jesus became flesh for the purpose of suffering death. Romans 8, 3 says what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And so, as we've been looking at chapter 2, the Jews did not and do not understand the incarnation. They did not understand Messiah was to die. In the ministry of Christ and in several of the Old Testament prophetic books, it was explained. But they didn't understand. In Acts 17, verses 2 and 3, it says, As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. So by becoming lower than the angels, Jesus accomplished what no angel could do. He removed the curse from man through his death. And for this purpose, he became for a time lower than the angels. By dying, he became our substitute. He tasted death for everyone. The word taste speaks of fully experiencing. He fully experienced death on behalf of us all. Why is that? Well, the wages of sin is death. So Jesus tasted of death on behalf of all of us. And in this sacrifice, God showed his love and his grace toward fallen creation. In 1 John 4, verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And the result, he was crowned with glory and honor. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21 says that God raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And Philippians 2, verse 10 makes it clear, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth. And there's your introduction. Let's begin at verse 10. For, he says, it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It was fitting, verse 10 says. The word fitting means it was proper. It's fitting. It's proper. It's consistent with the character of God. He's saying that God took the proper course of action when he gave Jesus to die on a cross. Why did that demonstrate that to us? Well, it showed two things. It showed his hatred for sin, and it showed his love for us. And so he took the right course to demonstrate those things. And he says, for whom are all things and by whom are all things? And so God is the goal for and the originator of all things, including salvation. And these things that Jesus Christ did, and this is what makes it fitting, is it brings glory to him. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, verse 11, it simply says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. That's one of the things that we need to remember, by the way. I'll say this briefly. Um, if there's anything that I see lacking, sometimes in, in general, in, in the life of many Christians, and oftentimes has been true with me, it's, it's a lack of sense of reverence for the things of God and for God himself. In heaven, it's going to be a place of so many things but including worship, worship. You know, um, if you get bored with worship, 
Heaven's not a place for you. There's another place where there is no worship. Because you're going to worship the Lord, worship the Lamb who was slain. It's going to be something that isn't boring. And it's not a source of entertainment. It's going to be multitudes and multitudes of voices that are raised in praise to the Lamb who was slain. The Lamb who poured out his blood for us. The Lamb who purchased us, who redeemed us. The Lamb who blessed us and kept us. The Lamb who loved us. And we'll have an understanding of that. And, and when we're there, we'll be singing and praising the Lord. And he's speaking concerning that. And I want you to notice how he speaks of him. It says, uh, again, it was fitting for him for, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The captain of their salvation. The word captain simply means the leader, the pioneer. Uh, Jesus is the only one, the captain of salvation, who by his death obtained salvation. He, he died in our place. And that necessitated him taking upon himself humanity. Now, when it says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, that speaks of being completely effective, completely effective. Perfect speaks of a completely effective act on his part. So the sufferings, brought him to the goal that he came to accomplish. That's what he means when he says, make the captain of salvation perfect through sufferings. He came to accomplish redemption. He isn't saying that Jesus wasn't perfect because you could read it and it says, well, look, it says to make him perfect. No, he isn't saying that Jesus wasn't perfect. He is saying that his goal was achieved. God's plan of salvation was centered on the death of Christ, on Jesus dying on a cross. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The goal was achieved. He came and died, fulfilling the plan of salvation. And he goes on in verse 11, and it says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. So he is the substitute. He's the author of salvation. But he also, notice verse 11, he also is called a sanctifier. He's the one who makes us holy. Holy. Later on in Hebrews in chapter 10, we'll get there in about two years. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, it says, we have, made, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So he sanctifies us. He says in verse 11 that we are, are all of one, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren. We are all of the one God, is what he's saying. And for this reason, he's not ashamed. The word ashamed speaks of being embarrassed. It speaks of reluctance through fear of humiliation or shame. Here's something for you. He's not ashamed of you. And I don't know if that matters to anybody in here, but it sure matters to me. He's not ashamed of me. You know, he's not ashamed to say I belong to him. And that has always spoken to me since I first saw that. He's not ashamed of saying, you are his family. Now, the work of his Holy Spirit in our lives causes us to live a life that, that will bring honor to him. In Mark 8, 36 through 38, let me read this to you. It says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And he goes on to say, If anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. When I first got saved, this is one of the scriptures that was embedded in my heart. He's not ashamed of me. Why should I be ashamed of him? 
And he has every reason to be ashamed of me. And I have no reason to be ashamed of him. And yet a lot of Christians, I, I see this, a lot of Christians are, are ashamed to be identified with Jesus Christ. They, they, you know, they'll go to school and, and they want to hide their faith. They'll, they'll be in college and, and the, the professor, very often, the professors will come against your faith and, and, and ridicule you. I had that happen when I was going to college, you know, and, and, and they will. You know, I've said this before, it comes to mind when I think of it, how that one of my classes uh, was, uh, I was a psych major for a while, never figured out what was wrong with me, so I went into another <laughs> major. But I was a psych sociology major, and um, we were in a, I was in a particular class, and the professor, he said, how many of you are Christians? How many of you are born and grown Christians? This was in Cal Poly and uh, in Pomona. How many of you are born again Christians? And so I and a few hands went up, my hand and a few hands went up. And he said to us, first day of class, I feel sorry for you. That was the professor, this doctor of psychology. I, I, I feel sorry for you because you believe the words in that little book, that little black book, speaking of the Bible. And he said, I believe in facts. I believe in studies. I believe in statistics. And he, he begins to tell us why he had a reasonable faith and we were unreasonable. That was my introduction. And then he used this in, as an example. He said, um, he said there, there's much research going on. Now, you have to remember this is many years ago now. But he said there's a lot of research going on right now that says that, that smoking uh, is going to produce uh, uh, lung cancer. He says, but I've got a lot of studies on my desk that prove that that's not true. And he died of lung cancer. And so a long time ago, I made a decision that I wasn't going to hide my faith under a basket. Now, I wasn't going to be one of those people who stood up with a bullhorn in class and yelled. But I was one who opened my mouth. And, and sometimes people say, well, that's easy for you. You're an old man now. Yeah, but I wasn't an old man then. I was in my early 20s. And I wasn't a seasoned Christian yet either. I was still growing. I was 24, 25. I had gotten saved when I was 20. I didn't get solid Bible studies until I was out of the army. So I was 23 when I began to learn the word of God. And I actually began to teach it and learn it at the same time. So it wasn't something that I was capable of defending. It was just something I held fast to and was willing to speak on behalf of. And I wasn't ashamed of being called a Christian. As a matter of fact, I was honored to be known as one who followed Jesus Christ. And he is not ashamed of you. And because he's not ashamed of you, why should you be ashamed of him? There are many people who need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. And because we're quiet, we allow him to go to hell. And that's just not a good thing to do. I'm not saying we ought to go out and shout at people. I'm simply saying that when given opportunity, we ought to speak and not go beyond what we know. Don't begin to, you know, start saying things you're not sure of, but say some things so that people know. God will give you opportunity and you will be blown away. And Jesus said, if you obey me, he said, my father and I will manifest ourselves to you in John chapter 14. And the fact is, as he does, you will be amazed at him showing up when you just open your mouth and you share. And so we are his adopted children, and he's not ashamed to be identified with us. He goes on, he says in verse 12, he says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So when he says, I'll de declare your name, this is speaking of Jesus proclaiming the message of salvation. This is actually an excerpt out of Psalm 22. He's saying, I will make your name known as I bring the gospel message. And then again, verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. And so as the son, Jesus puts his trust in the father. And when you read the scriptures and you read the New Testament, you'll see that he lived in total dependence upon his father. An example is John 5, 19, when Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees a father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. 
And so he put his trust in the Father and lived in total dependence. In verse 13, and again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Well, Jesus is our brother, not by nature. He's our brother because we have been born again. He is the only begotten son of God. We are adopted into his family. He has chosen us. A little girl had been adopted, but didn't know it. As she had grown a little bit older, her adopted mama and daddy took her aside and told her, we adopted you. We didn't bear you in a natural way, but we, we made you our own. We chose you. And then one day, as happens, she had a mean little cousin. And the mean little cousin said, my mommy and daddy had me. I belong to them. But you, you're adopted. You weren't born to your mommy and daddy. You're adopted by them. And the little girl who had been adopted said, that's true, I'm adopted. My mommy and daddy chose me, and they loved me, but they chose me. But your parents are stuck with you. <laughs> In a way, why I told you that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but we are. We're adopted into the family of God. We've been taken in. He is the only begotten son, but we have been called his brethren through adoption he goes on and says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through, their, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So inasmuch then as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, the word partaken is, is the same word that is used for fellowship, koinonia. It's the same basic word. It speaks of communion. So all human beings, he's saying, are flesh and blood. What does he mean by that? All human beings have human nature. So men are related to one another by sharing a common human nature. And so Jesus needed to be fully man to be the substitute on behalf of men. So he shared in the same, in the same human nature, in perfect human nature, but in human nature, that through death he might destroy the one who had the power of death. Now when it says he shared, that word shared, it speaks of him taking hold of something that wasn't his own, of his own kind. So you see, we are flesh and blood, but Jesus was not by nature only human he willingly took hold of something that did not naturally belong to him, enabling him to die in our place. That's what he's saying. That, he says in verse 14, through death he might destroy him who has the power of death. Now, the word destroy, that he may destroy, speaks of making something inoperative. It speaks of rendering him powerless, that he, through death, might destroy him who had the power of death. Now, who's he speaking of? Obviously, he's speaking of the devil. And he makes it very clear there, who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, let me develop this with you. Satan is not a sovereign king of death. Satan does not kill whom he wills at his whim. He doesn't have that. When it speaks of him having the power of death, it's speaking of the operation. He leads an operation that is in constant opposition to God and to God's will. Again, in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are of God. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So it's Satan's activity that introduced sin and death followed as a penalty. So he promotes sin and sin results in death. In Genesis 2.17, the command is, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that ye eat of it 
you shall surely die. And so what the enemy does is he is promoting rebellion against God, even though we already, by our sin nature, are rejecting the things of God. And by failing and falling in sin and having a sin nature, he is using his influence to keep us held bondage so that we will die and perish forever. And so he's saying that the children have partaken of flesh and blood. He himself, Jesus, shared in the same. He took upon himself human flesh, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And release those who were through fear of death. I was thinking about that today um, a bit as I was preparing this. What is it that terrifies people the most? Death. Death. It holds people in what? In bondage. Just as an example, all of us, I think, can relate to. And I, I'm, I'm still amazed, and I don't see this in, in the negative. I, I, I just see it. I'm still amazed at how many people during the COVID problem actually got not only afraid, but got, got aggressively afraid. I was on a plane with uh, Raul Reese and another friend of mine. We were on our way to a meeting, and Raul was sitting in front of me, and right in front of me was an a uh, gentleman, older gentleman, and his wife. And I was sitting directly behind the older gentleman. And this was a couple, two, three years ago now. And Raul had taken off his mask so he could eat, which we were allowed to do at that time on planes. And he hadn't put it on quickly enough for the older man. So the older man leans over and yells at Raul. He doesn't know that he shouldn't do that. <laughs> Some of you may not know Raul Reese. I, I can't see how you couldn't, but Raul, Raul has been an eighth degree Sansu Kung Fu master for 40 some years. You just don't do that. And the guy yelled at him. And I'm looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, oh, you just, oh, you just poked it. You poked a, you poked a lion. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. But Raul was, Raul's a very humble man, and Raul says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he puts his mask on. The guy's got this kind of, like, bravado going, and it bothered me. So I leaned over. The guy was in front of me. I leaned over so my mouth is near his ear. <laughs> and I said, Raul, how long have you been a kung fu master? Mm, about 40 years. Then I sat back. You should have seen that guy scurry off the plane when we landed. <laughs> there's, this, there's this thing about fear. Fear of death. We're all going to die. Look out, right? Well, you know what? The fact is all people are afraid of death. We know that. I'm not saying that, that oh, you know what? I ain't afraid of death. No, I, I'm not afraid of death, and no Christian ought to be. Why? Because our, 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 our life is wrapped up in Christ. Be, because by his resurrection, Jesus Christ took away this weapon that Satan had. The fear of death, you see. In, in his resurrection, Jesus conquered. He conquered sin. He conquered the grave. He conquered the devil. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, it says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So instead of fearing death, we recognize that it's something that is kind of like a door. We understand that death is, is something that we need not fear. Because according to Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's gain. You know, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know, in Christ, we have, oh, I, can, I just get caught up with that. You know, I don't, I, you, we don't have, I have, we don't have to fear. I have, I have a, a compassion for those who have fear. I do. I'm not any better than anybody else. And I understand that some people, we can deal with that. Okay. But you got to put your eyes on Jesus Christ. 
He conquered the grave. So we have no fear of death. And that's what he's telling us. You got to understand that. I saw so many Christians who were afraid. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. Because your life is in Christ. It's wrapped up in him. And death terrifies people. We need to remember that death is what has been referred to as the final enemy. He is not my friend. Death has been conquered by Christ. Death has been swallowed up by life. And that's why believers in Christ can go to their death with hope. Because I may close my eyes here, but I open my eyes there. And that's, what we, that's our hope. And in verse 16, indeed, he doesn't give aid to angels but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So he didn't come to save angels. He came to save man. He speaks of the seed of Abraham. These would be spiritual descendants, as who's he whom he's referring to. He doesn't give aid to the seed of Abraham. He's speaking of, of spiritual descendants. He gives aid to spirit. He gives aid to us, not angels. In, in Romans 4, 3 through 5, it says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and, and it was credited to him as righteousness. When a man works, his wages are not credited to him as gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who doesn't work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So we, we are saved by faith in God. Jesus didn't come to save angels. He came to save us. That's why it says in verse 17, in all things, he, he had to be made like his brethren. He, he came to experience what we experience. And it shows us his understanding of us and his mercy towards us. It says in verse 18, he himself has suffered being tempted. He's able to aid those who are tempted. He felt everything, everything. He took upon himself the sin of the world. He took upon himself. And though he was tempted by the enemy, he never, he never succumbed, but he experienced on our behalf those things and understands them. He felt everything we ever feel but he resisted every temptation. And in this, he's able to aid us when we ourselves are tempted. I don't have, you don't have some distant God way out there somewhere that you have to beg and plead with to somehow get his attention. I was in Manila, Philippines, and I went to a particular church in the center of Manila. And I've seen this also in Mexico City. And there were people on their knees crawling into the church and crawling through the center aisle. And many of them had crawled for some distance and their knees are torn up. And, and you know why they're doing that. They're doing that to try to get the attention of God. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You just call, because he's your daddy. When my Anna was a little girl, and I'll close with this, our bedroom had a hallway that led to our children's rooms. And so there was the boys' room, Corinne's room across from them. Next was Anna's room, a bathroom, and then our bedroom. Our bedroom was probably 25 feet from the doorway of Anna's bedroom. And I can still remember one night, about 3 or 4 in the morning, I could hear her with her little voice. She was only 4, maybe 5. <laughs> Daddy, Daddy. So I, I was quiet. Daddy. And I turned to Maria, I think the baby's calling you. <laughs> she says, I, uh, she's saying, Daddy. And I said, what baby? She said, Daddy, I'm afraid. 
And I said, okay. She says, I want to get in your bed with you and mommy. I said, fine. She said, come and get me. I said, no. I said, no, you come to me. Now, you may think this is cruel. There was a reason I did that. Marie wouldn't get out of bed. No, there... <laughs> I said, follow my voice. Follow my voice. And so I could see her, I could see her outline. I said, Daddy's here, come to me, come to me. And she began to walk and she followed my voice until she came to the bed and was comfortably laying next to her dad. Why did I do that? Because I wanted her to know that in the midst of her darkness and the fear she may have, if you follow the Father's voice, you'll be safe. And that's a lesson I tried to teach her as a baby. And so the key will always be follow your father's voice. Jesus understands you. He understands you. He went through everything you did, yet he had no sin. So he can give you strength when you find yourself in a place of temptation. Call unto him.